tell you a little bit about my role on a kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, as the Chief Operations Officer, I'm really responsible um, to ensure the day-to-day -day operations of our scope. Um, I report directly to the president of the company. Um, I have eight vice presidents and we have about 2,300 employees supporting the mission. So uh, a sizable work group um, with lots of varying capacities and capabilities that we provide. So we provide services to the Hanford site that most of you get today um, from your local cities or counties. So we provide the electrical power to the grid. We provide water and sewer for more than a thousand facilities. Um, we provide IT infrastructure, whether that be um, fiber optics all the way to the computers sitting on an employee's desks. We have our own patrol force and our own fire department. So we are, in essence, um, a self-contained little city. I will say with one major exception, we do not have a Starbucks on the Hanford site. Um, yet, you know, to my chagrin, we do not have a Starbucks. But so we're responsible for really making sure that, that all of those uh, components that are needed for uh, the site to perform all of their cleanup duties and responsibilities um, are provided to them. And so, again, I have been on the Hanford site for almost 30 years. So I have had the benefit of being part of various different um, programs and projects across the Hanford landscape. And that really has, I'll say, afforded me an opportunity to get a good understanding of I'll say where some of the pinch points are, um, where companies may, may need um, more service, less service. Um, when they have a, a failure of some system, um, I understand the, the relative importance of that and, and how we need to go achieve to get items corrected and fixed, repaired, whatever that might look like. Um, the goal is, again, to, to be able to provide those basic city services um, at the core to allow the other projects to keep moving forward. So I'll be honest, when I started more than 30 years ago out here, um, I certainly did not quite understand the full legacy of the Hanford history. Um, and I, you know, really did not have an inkling that 30 years later that I would be um, part of such a great organization and team um, really tackling one of the most exciting and challenging cleanup missions in our nation. Um, I would have to say that my career chose me. Um, I, you know, thought long and hard back when I was in college, wanted, thought I'd go to law school. After I got my undergrad degree, I'm like, no, I'm really not interested in going another four years to school. I think I want to go get into the workforce. Let me see what that looks like. Um, and so that's what I chose to do. I don't think when I was in college, I ever sat back and go, gee, I want to work for a federal contractor cleaning up a legacy waste site. Um, you know, there's no degree program for that. You, you kind of, you know, I'll say find it through um, some opportunities that were that came my way. So I went to Gonzaga University. Yes, the same one that's ranked number one in the NCAA men's basketball. So in case anybody is interested in who's going to be the winner this year, I'm pretty sure it's the year for the Zags. So again, my original plan was to attend law school. Um, but I came, I came back to the Tri-Cities, which is where I grew up, graduated from high school here. And, and we, had, of course, knew about Hanford, knew that there were good jobs at Hanford, but weren't really sure of, you know, well, what do they do out there? I know there's a gate. I know you had to show a badge. You couldn't just go out and visit. So, gee, what, what is all the, the Hanford site about? So I happened to apply for a job that was posted at that point when jobs were still in the newspaper. Yes, that's how you found jobs back in the day. They were on the news in the newspaper. And um, there was a company called Kelly Administrative Services. And we were called at that point, we were called Kelly Girls. And we provided basic administrative support to organizations. And I was lucky enough to be placed with a team um, and a great manager who really, um, I'll say, saw the potential and drive that I had and helped mentor me, which led me to um, going back to school, um, getting a master's degree, um, and being able to then, you know, kind of, I'll say, use 
use that as a stepping stone to get into different management roles um, and try some pieces of scope that were really outside of what I thought I might ever like to do. And so I'll say, you know, you don't know until you try. It is, it is true. Um, sometimes assignments would be a little bit scary and, and you need to be willing and able to go jump in and know that, you know, you come out the other side um, learning and understanding a, a significant amount of information that perhaps you really didn't know that you would um, find valuable. And it may not seem valuable um, at that time, um, but certainly as you um, mature through your career, you will look back and lean on all of those experiences that you have, whether it be last year, five years from now, um, 10 years back, you will simply go draw on all of those things that, that you felt um, kind of helped advance you to what took place in your job or your career planning. Um, and I will say when you, when you find the right fit um, and you feel that you're making a difference, um, that becomes the motivator, um, not only for yourself, but I'll say for your work team. Um, and again, the, the job out here is, is, is highly technical um, in nature. Um, it, can be at times, depending on the role or the function, extremely high risk. Um, of course, safety is paramount to everything that we do here. And so really being part of a, a work group and work team that takes that seriously every single day, um, it really um, makes a difference in how you motivate and, and drive people. Um, but when that fit is right, um, it really does um, help you support your work team. Um, specifically here at, at HMIS, um, our work team is our family. Like many of you, I'm sure, um, we tend to spend a significant amount of our day, um, maybe not during COVID, but certainly pre-COVID and maybe someday in the future, a significant amount of our day is spent with our coworkers. Um, and so being able to um, align your core values um, with them and, and treat them as if they are your, your family member um, and caring about their, their safety, their well-being, their growth in their jobs. Um, it just helps promote um, the, the, the job excellence that we all are really wanting in our careers and in our lives. Um, so it's very important. Um, so what does my day look like on a, on a daily kind of a normal basis? Well, first I'll say there's really not much normal um, in any one given day when you're um, managing um, the size of the site that we manage here. So, you know, I am a, a morning person, I will say. So I'm up around 4.30 and typically in the office by 5.30 a.m. Um, we start our day at 5.45 daily with a supervisor call of about 120 to 130 supervisors daily. Um, and why do we do that? We get a lot of questions. Why do you do that, Amy? I said, well, and here's why. Um, because of the vastness of our site and the various different capacities and services that we provide, it's important that our supervisor team understand what the key um, projects are taking place that day. Is there any type of safety component that they need to be mindful of? And it really is just that quick check-in. Typically, the meetings last 15 minutes or less. Um, and it really is just to inform folks um, that says, hey, we got your back. Here's what you need to be mindful of today. Here's a couple of things that might be different. Um, and, and really, it kind of brings people together. Communication, communication, communication. Um, it really does help give people um, the awareness and the, the foundation that they need to go provide and perform work in a safe manner um, and know that, you know, that nobody should be caught off guard if there's, you know, oh, gee, we're, we're doing this job evolution next to me. And I had no idea what it was. So we really do want to make sure that we're communicating on a regular basis. Um, again, because we are dealing with a, a very um, important role and maintaining all of those services to our to our customers. Um, so again, so that's the morning of most of my day. Um, as with most companies, and I'm sure all of you, um, I have no shortage of meetings um, in my day. Um, they range from meeting with our customers, which we have many besides our Department of Energy customer. Um, again, we support the other Hanford contractors, so keeping them apprised of 
potential outages, um, understanding and working with them on issues that they may have, um, as well as, um, you know, it may even be outside dealing with the um, local city and counties on projects that we're coordinating with them. Um, so no shortage of meetings. Um, and a lot of it um, is even meeting with employees. We, we anticipate and drive to have a lot of employee involvement in our planning for projects and work evolutions. Um, and that really supports our uh, approach to sound decision making. Um, again, with the broad scope that I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I, at the end of the day, remain very nimble to be able to respond to whatever might happen on any given day, whether that be a water main break, um, a site wildland fire that might be spreading somewhere, a snowstorm that we now have to go clear roads and, and prepare people to come on site and off site safely. Um, and again, while I do not directly uh, perform any of those jobs I just listed. It's important as the leader of the organization to be aware of those critical jobs uh, and to be able to support our teams that are performing those on a day to day basis 24 seven. So our, our site doesn't close down at five o'clock and we put a padlock on and walk away. Um, we have folks here that are here 24 seven 365 days a year um, to go perform. Um, the duties that are necessary here. So it's important for us to, to, you know, and me specifically to understand what are some of those things that are um, important or occurring on any given day. And we're dealing with an infrastructure that is really, um, you know, it's 75 years old. So not everything is, is new. So some of our infrastructure, our water systems, et cetera, are, are extremely old and we spend a lot of time keeping them maintained and, and doing maintenance on them. Um, but you know, failures are bound to occur. So um, again, working through the logistics of, of a aged infrastructure and um, you know, ensuring our customers have what they need um, is, is certainly something we continue to manage and deal with. Um, on the flip side of that, I will say that the fun and exciting part of my job and, and really I'll say Hanford as a whole is we are seeing a shift of, you know, um, modernization of some of our facilities and some of our infrastructure utilizing some technology. So the technology piece is certainly something um, that we are looking at and continuing to invest in. Um, it is kind of the, the way of the future. And again, there'll be some exciting job opportunities moving forward for um, support to that technology. So pretty exciting as we um, kind of move along in the technology arena. Um, so, you know, being a long-term Hanford employee, I'll say that, that uh, the pathway to my current role um, really allowed me to see various jobs out of the Hanford site. Um, and so it gives me the, the understanding of a day-to-day -day working in the life of the boots on the ground individuals um, in many regards. Um, and part of my approach from the very beginning of my career um, has to never say no to a challenge. Um, I've had some jobs that I've stepped into knowing very little um, about the scope and scared to death that I was going to fail because I'm like, what do I know about operating X, Y, or Z? Um, but those jobs is, are probably the jobs where I learned the most um, and not just about the technical components, but uh, the type of leader that I wanted to be. Um, and, and what that meant to me as, as part of my fundamental core value. Um, so all of those jobs, in my opinion, have shaped the way that I choose to lead. Um, and I consider myself a boots on the ground leader who values input from really all levels of the organization. Um, while I get to come to work and, and, and I have a, you know, a nice office and, and I don't have to be necessarily out in the weather or in the elements or driving a truck all day or sitting in a, um, a patrol car. I have a significant amount of respect for all of those folks that are the boots on the ground people that make it happen every single day. We at HMIS, we don't produce a widget. We don't have an assembly line. Our assets are our people. And so um, the ability to, to be able to be able to communicate with them and not just talk to them is extremely important in what we do and how we collaborate and build our team. Um, because again, we have a very 
um, important critical mission that takes all of us working together. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've really taken a lot from the various leaders and mentors that I have had the luxury of having um, over the course of 30 years, many of which I communicate with um, probably on a weekly basis, many of which don't even live in the state of Washington anymore. So, I mean, when you can find some mentors that really help connect you um, with, you know, being a, a, a servant leader of sorts and, and being able to really um, connect with your employees, I think it really goes a long way. So, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a leader who doesn't get, I'll say, caught up in the title. Um, and don't, don't let that get in the way of helping and doing. Um, so I, I work hard to foster that approach um, through my leadership team down to the employee level. Um, and, and again, our asset are our people and we really need to make sure that we are um, taking care of them both in terms of their you know not just their personal safety um, but but in terms of their growth and their development and and how we want to um, consider what they want to do and how they want to improve and help the mission so um, I always say that to many people that, you know, Amy, how do you know this and that about Hanford? And, and I consider myself to be a forever learner. Um, and you have to be a forever learner to be a good leader. Um, not every organization you lead will be the same. Um, so you have to be able to adapt, um, yet maintain your core values that many people have become, they've, they've come to count on those. Um, so. Again, I think it's important that um, there's no shortage of information, whether it be on Hanford or any other job career area that you're interested in, uh, but you have to be willing to put in the hard work, um, read it, understand it, um, ask the right questions, ask a lot of questions. Um, and again, just that forever learner is extremely important to me and, and I think it makes us all be better leaders. So, my recommendation to students today is to recognize that you need to be a forever learner um, and be willing to accept challenges and recognize that sometimes those challenges will pay off and sometimes they may not. Um, in the end, you, you will certainly gain um, some valuable insight, um, some skills, and you may not recognize it at the time, but you will cherish them over time. Um, hard work becomes easy if you love it. Um, I tell people regularly, I probably, I think I have the best job at Hanford. Um, just for all of the, the differences and the different things that I get to do and see every single day, I am convinced I have the best job at Hanford. Um, I will say that um, I get asked this a lot, managing the Hanford site through COVID has probably been one of the most challenging experiences of my career. Um, I'd also say that managing through COVID has also now been probably the most rewarding experience that I've had. Um, we saw teamwork thrive and we saw individuals really step up to the plate. Um, and I don't know that very many people are going to be able to ever say that they managed a, a you know, to, to manage a 10,000 person site um, through a worldwide pandemic. I hope that no one ever has to say those words um, ever again. Um, but you know, I get to I get to say that, and and I'm proud to be able to be part of the team that really, um, you know, there was no playbook for how we were going to manage um, the COVID. Like many of you, um, our lives got turned upside down a year ago, um, and we've been working for this past year to kind of what. How do, we, how do we move forward with work activities? How do we protect our workers? Um, and, and really, you know, there's of course a lot of different um, people have opinions of what works, what doesn't work. And, and at the end of the day, we have to really make some decisions in the best interest of um, a, a broader work group. Um, so it's been, it's been an interesting challenge, um, but I will tell you at the end, um, don't settle for easy. Right, so you, you just never know when you might be asked to lead a situation that nobody has ever managed before. And that's what we have all been, the cards we've been dealt this last year. Um, and again, not just me, not just the management team, nor just Hanford, it's across the nation, right? We've all been 
dealt some cards, none of which there was a very good playbook for. Um, and we've all had to lead a situation that we've never managed before. And I suspect that most will be much better leaders after that. The level of care and empathy and support to team um, really has, I think, shined through um, as, as we've come through this year of COVID. Um, again, knock on wood, we don't ever have to go through something like it again. Who would have thought? Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy, for that. We have a couple of questions. Great. Um, in a predominantly male-dominated workspace, um, how has the role of women in leadership evolved at your workplace? Uh, great question. Great question. So, you know, I get asked that question a lot as well. So I will say that um, you know, we, we value I I inclusion. Um, and, and again, we really are looking for um, individuals that can fill the role um, in the right way. So I, I think that we have seen the women in leadership and executive roles really start to, um, I'll say, get equal footing. I, I get asked a lot, Amy, through your 30 years, have you, have you ever experienced a time when um, you know, because you were a female that perhaps you didn't, weren't given the opportunities that somebody else might've been given. And, and I will tell you that I have not, I have not personally experienced that. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that, that we have come a long way. I think that it certainly doesn't hurt to have some women in the executive ranks to help make sure that that balance um, is maintained and considered. Um, but again, as, as, as we see throughout the, you know, not just the, the government world and, and some of the high tech jobs, but I think you're starting to see some of that um, equal out, um, in my opinion. And, and again, we, 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 need, we need a lot of athletes on this team and, you know, male, female, whatever we need to do to get the right players um, on the team, we will do. Um, and again, so I've not seen I've not seen any disparity, I'll say, in from the women at Hanford. Um, and at least in my career, I have not personally experienced um, where I felt that I was, you know, not provided an opportunity because I was a woman. Yeah. Um, Amy, how did you get involved with Junior Achievement? So, you know, um, I have been teaching. I was a, a, a instructor for junior achievement for sheesh probably over 20 years now um, and i really wanted to um, I identify with kids who i, I felt anyway that the, the school just really was not able to provide the financial literacy um, and, and so i had researched a few different organizations um, junior achievement was was one that i had heard of only heard of at the time um, met with the director at that point, and, and she convinced me to, to give a class a try, um, and I did. I taught sixth grade for many, many years um, and, and really got hooked on it. Um, and again, I think that, that now it's even more important for our kids to, to ensure that they have some of the skill sets that, that JA provides. Um, it really is vital, and, and, and some of those um, you know, you really need that hands-on specific instruction that you just, you know, may not get in, in the basic classroom. Awesome. One final question. How has your leadership style evolved during COVID and who were some of your mentors? So, um, again, so my leadership style from a COVID perspective, I, I think that all of us had to learn a little bit more about, about our employees. So um, we at the Hanford site sent folks home for a, at least some of them, not all of them, because as I said, we do 24 seven, but going to a very um, large telework population. So probably at least 50 to 60% of our folks for a period of time were teleworking. Um, and, and so not having that daily interaction with employees, you had to figure out a different way to connect with them. And sometimes connecting through Teams or Zoom or whatever platform you're using, um, well, it, it took some folks some time to feel comfortable. 
Um, but you know, that doesn't necessarily replace what you can gather from somebody um, if they're having a bad day, if they're having a tough day, right? They can just turn the video off and you don't really know, are, are they okay? So being able to connect with people perhaps on a more emotional level and having a different level of empathy for them um, really, I think it has been highlighted as a, um, a, a little bit of shift um, in my management style because um, I know that some folks have really struggled with being at home and not having the personal connections that they were so used to having. Well, with that, I want to thank you all for joining with us this afternoon and thank you, Amy, for your time and expertise. I put a feedback survey in the chat box. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey to be entered into a drawing to win a Starbucks gift card. Our next Lunch with Leaders will be March 24th, featuring Esther Rechman from Bank of America. Thank you again, Amy, and have a great St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Thank you.